I want to acknowledge some of the people that are here today. Theo Nelly, Consul General of Bahamas. Ed Royce, former House Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Ambassador Hedek Komanicic of Czech Republic. Uh, Ambassador Keith Azuparde of Malta, thank you for coming. And Ambassador of Sri Lanka, Rodney Pereira, thank you for joining us. So, we usually have a very interesting event, and it's a short interview and networking, so I think you're going to enjoy the evening. I want to thank our sponsors, Sohori Insurance, AV Actions, who does the AV for us at all our events, and 1331. This is a beautiful property. If you get a chance, go out on the balcony. We come one night in March or April, actually. The light will be up, and you have the best view of the cherry blossoms here. Yes. I want to thank uh, Steve Briggs, CEO, President of CEO, President Holly Hall, VP, Managing Director of Republic. Republic is the developer and owner of this fine property, 1331, and a prime sponsor for this event. I want to recognize David Riley, General Manager of 1331. He, will, um, he would like to invite you to meet with him. David's right over here in the purple tie. Or members of his team for a tour of the building if you'd like. So please uh, talk to him or Susie if you'd like, or TAAPR, okay? And we're gonna start in a few minutes. Uh, Anna does our interviews. A lot of you know Anna. She, she really studies hard for these events. Uh, when I told her it was today, she said, that's my anniversary. Uh, 15 years. Uh, 15 years. Uh, 15 years. Uh, 15 years. Uh, I told them to throw a party for it, so this is her party. So, I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Take it well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, uh, my husband, for putting up with me for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and of course, thank you, Ambassador, for joining us tonight. So just to give uh, a brief intro, um, you know, journalists often say that any country is located in a tough neighborhood. I know because I often write my stories that way and say it. Um, but when you're a country that's only three and a half times larger than Washington, D.C. itself, and you're connected via causeway to Saudi Arabia, which is almost 3,000 times bigger than you. Um, oh, and across the waters of the Persian Gulf, you've got Iran staring down at you. Uh, let's face it, it is a pretty tough piece of real estate to live in. Uh, oh, and I forgot, you're also home to a critical naval base of the United States. So, needless to say, Bahrain has had to navigate this very tricky landscape of competing foreign interests and regional conflicts really ever since its independence in 1971. At the same time, it's had to focus on pressing issues at home, including diversifying its oil-based economy and managing religious tensions among its now 1.5 million people. So we're very pleased to have Ambassador Al Khalifa with us here today to discuss the many developments both in the region and at home. Uh, and before though we get into a lot of the politics, I want to start with one of the most urgent issues that is gripping countries large and small, which is of course the coronavirus outbreak. I've read now that Bahrain has 26 confirmed cases of coronavirus. Ambassador, can you start by just telling us what steps the government is taking to guard against an outbreak? Well, first of all, let me thank you, Victor, for the kind introduction. And, uh, and I thank you very much for uh, moderating this session, and thank you all for being here and allowing me the opportunity to, set, to shed some light on uh, some of the critical issues that are going on in Bahrain. Uh, starting out with the coronavirus, for those of you who know Anna, she uh, likes to dive in and ask the <laughs> critical questions. Uh, but uh, the government of Bahrain has uh, looked at the coronavirus with a, a, a very serious approach. Uh, transparency has been one of the key elements of uh, making sure that all the information is being fed in the correct manner. Um, I think it was two or three weeks ago when we started engaging with, uh, as embassies, with the um, Department of, of uh, Health, with uh, entities like the CBP, to look at the best practices around the world and to look at SOPs. We were grateful here at the U.S. to receive some of that. and rallied it back uh, to Bahrain. Now, um, 
I have to say that uh, all the cases that were identified in Bahrain were cases of individuals that came from one country, came from one source, they came from Iran. And um, we have uh, already started to put in place measures to make sure that one, we're protecting from the spread of virus from abroad, but also making sure that domestically it's being addressed. So uh, there has been a uh, two week isolation period. Now we're looking at maybe three or four, depending on the more information we get on the virus itself. But uh, we've allocated a, uh, a center uh, that is a standalone center to look at only the cases that we have. Uh, the number is going up. Uh, Percentage-wise, because it's a small population, um, for those of you that look at percentage, it might look high, but at the end of the day, we look at cases and we're looking at half the number of cases that are here in the U.S. So uh, we're still looking at it uh, uh, very seriously, and we're hopeful that we will be able to contain it. And now from what I read, just one more question on the subject. Obviously, Iran is, is a huge concern. Um, there are suspicions that uh, it hasn't been transparent of the total number of cases. So are it, flights, have, have there been quarantines issued or, or bans on flights at the moment from Bahrain? Because of uh, the diplomatic relations that we have with Iran, there aren't any direct flights to Iran. Mm -hmm. But um, there are Bahrainis that were in Iran and came, uh, trans transited to a con another other countries and came to Bahrain. And so uh, what goes without say is that uh, we have only one international airport and that's why it's become uh, a bit easier to deal with. There's one causeway, although we haven't seen any cases from the causeway itself. So we're looking at uh, containment in the uh, airport and directly to the medical facility. We're looking at immediate families as well. And uh, we are seeing um, an understanding in the Bahraini community. And uh, uh, there are a lot of support and an understanding that they need to go through a process uh, of isolation for it. And there are videos that uh, came out with people in isolation, and they're in good form and good shape. And I think it's, uh, it's another positive. Well, let's all finger, keep our fingers crossed. But uh, staying on the subject of Iran and looking at the broader picture, I mean, obviously tensions with Iran continue have continued to escalate, uh, particularly since President Trump pulled out of the nuclear accord in, in 2018. Uh, last year, the president further tightened economic sanctions on Iran. Uh, afterward, there were a series of tanker skirmishes in the Gulf, the attack on Saudi oil facilities, and most recently, the U.S. killing of Major General Qassem Soleimani, uh, commander of Iran's elite Quds Force. So and today, I just read that U.S. forces are officially back in Saudi Arabia to serve as a deterrent against Iran. So, Ambassador, uh, two questions. How concerned are you about these ongoing tensions possibly tipping into a full-blown uh, war, especially given that Bahrain itself is home to the U.S. Fifth Fleet, so your country would inevitably become embroiled in any kind of full-scale full -scale conflict? Well, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the tensions between the U.S. and Iran uh, have been escalating. Uh, from our perspective in Bahrain, and if you will allow me to uh, just give a little bit of a historical context to uh, where we stand with our relationship with Iran. For the past four decades, we have seen a uh, consistent uh, aggression from Iran towards Bahrain. Uh, over a period of time, we have uh, learned to push back on Iranian activities and proxies within Bahrain. Uh, what we think is very important for us to do is uh, to showcase how the Islamic Republic of Iran infiltrates a country. Um, what are the tools that uh, it uses in order to turn a small militia uh, into a political society and, and uh, uh, later on control government in the cases of other countries. But in Bahrain, we've been able to push back on it. Um, and uh, we have seen that uh, escalation has been going up for the past 40 years or so. But specifically, if we were to look at the past 10 years, the number of attacks by proxies on 
police officers have been increasing. Specifically from 2015 up until 2017 was the peak, uh, not only in uh, the number of attacks, but also in the severity of the attacks themselves. Uh, in 2017, we've seen a reduction. Uh, that might have been because of lack of funding, but uh, we're looking at numbers. And if we look at the security situation in Bahrain today, it's comparable to 2010 with the, with the amount of, uh, of reduction against uh, uh, attacks against uh, police officers and uh, innocent bystanders. And so I think that uh, Iran has a lot on its plate today. Um, it has a regional situation that it has to deal with, but also an internal situation as well. And that might be the cause of, uh, of, of the reduction in the amount of proxy activities in, uh, in Bahrain. So on that note, you mentioned uh, the year 2015 and, and proxy activities, which of course uh, brings us to the nuclear agreement. And, uh, you know, President Trump uh, controversially decided to pull out of the nuclear accord, um, the 2015 nuclear accord, and one of the reasons, of course, citing destabilizing um, activity in the region, and he has since embarked on a, a maximum pressure campaign. Uh, now, critics of, of this move point out that by most accounts, Iran was abiding by the terms of the agreement, and it had verifiably lengthened the breakout period for it to develop a nuclear weapon. Um, the pressure campaign has certainly succeeded in terms of squeezing the economy. So far, it has not brought the Iranians back to the negotiating table. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing them abandon terms of the agreement. And most recently, we were seeing hardliners making a comeback uh, at the expense of the moderates. So, what is your government's take both on President Trump's decision to withdraw from the nuclear agreement and also the subsequent maximum pressure campaign that he has championed? Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, in 2015, when the heads of the GCC states came to the United States and the idea of the JCPOA was presented, um, all the countries were on board. Um, the JCPOA addressed one component, which is the nuclear issue, but when we look, every country has its own priorities. If you would ask us in Bahrain, the number one priority would be proxy activity uh, in the region. Why? Because we have witnessed it firsthand. Uh, it has done a lot to tear the social fabric of the country, and we need to, every time uh, an, an, an issue like that happens, we need to uh, come back and pull everyone together and it takes uh, time and energy and effort and so um, with the pullout of the jcpoa we're looking at numbers we're looking at statistics uh, everyone is pushing for de-escalation yes but if, if we ask ourselves how can bahrain de-escalate what and, and i put this question out there i mean if bahrain is a country that has respected its borders, that has always operated within its borders, um, are we going to see the Islamic Republic also de-escalate with the Quds force in, uh, in, in position? That's the, qu the type of questions that we need to be asking ourselves today. Um, no one in the region wants war, uh, but uh, we would like for Iran to act as a normal nation not as uh, the number one sponsor of terror in the world. Now, in one more last, we could obviously go on about Iran for, for quite a while, but one more last question. I mean, they, there were reports last year that the Saudis, the Emiratis, had engaged in some back-channel talks with Iran to, to cool tensions. I mean, would Bahrain, in theory, looking ahead, be open to dialogue with Iran? Well, I think that Bahrain has... Uh, severed its relations with Iran uh, for uh, a reason that uh, everyone knows. Um, and until recently, you have officials in Iran calling Bahrain the 13th province. It's that type of dialogue that has been unproductive in the past. Um, like I said, I, I reiterate the fact that a solution needs to be um, 
reached, but at the end of the day, we aren't seeing a serious approach from the Islamic Republic to uh, resolve the issue of uh, their hegemonic ambitions in the region. You have a constitution that has within it um, the idea of exporting the revolution. So with a constitution like that, it becomes very hard for countries to, um, to start uh, talking to. I want to switch gears to uh, another crisis in the region that is often overlooked, although we are, have written about it in our current issues, but um, obviously, hostilities between Iran and, and your ally Saudi Arabia go back many decades. Uh, but many of those tensions have now spilled over into a Yemen, mm -hmm. which this month marks five years since Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners, Bahrain included, uh, intervened after Houthi rebels ousted the internationally recognized government. Uh, since then, Yemen has become the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Uh, while the Iran-backed Houthis have been accused of human rights abuses, Saudi Arabia too has come under fire for causing a number of civilian deaths through indiscriminate bombing campaigns. And in 2018, there was some pushback in Congress over whether to approve um, $300 million in weapon sales to Bahrain, uh, specifically because of the Saudi air bombing campaign. So, Ambassador, uh, number one, how do you respond to what is ongoing criticism in, in Congress of the Saudi-led campaign? And also, where does the situation stand at the moment? We've seen a lot of ups and downs. Things, things looked good late last year, and then another outbreak of violence took place in January. So where are you seeing the situation today? Well, first of all, I have to um, reassess Bahrain's backing to the uh, UN Special Envoy's uh, mission in the region. Um, what we have seen Iran do in Yemen is uh, it has redivided a united Yemen. And this issue has been going on for a number of years. Um, it is very critical that uh, there is stability in Yemen because of the geographic location of Yemen. Um, when we look at the humanitarian crisis and we look at donors, Saudi Arabia comes number one uh, as the biggest donor uh, to the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. They pay $900 million uh, a year. The U.S. pays more or less the same. So my question is, for taxpayers here in the U.S., that money is going to Yemen because of an issue that the Iranians have created in Yemen. So I think that there has to be a reasoning behind it, and the only way forward in Yemen is for us to uh, curb the influence of Iran in Yemen. Now, we have worked uh, with research entities here in DC to look at uh, components of IEDs that were found in Bahrain and compare them to IEDs that were found in Yemen and in Iraq. All the components, or some of them, um, in all three IEDs uh, point back to Iran. And so we're starting to look at uh, um, a geographic map of proxy activities and interconnecting them. And we're looking at a bigger picture. And so, um, like I said, the only way forward in Yemen is uh, to see a disengagement uh, of Iranians uh, or Iranian activities in Yemen. Now, but one quick follow-up question. Obviously, the Saudis and Emiratis U.S. have been huge donors of humanitarian aid. On the flip side, many groups have criticized them for, you know, bearing the brunt of the civilian, um, civilian death. So is, do you see among the coalition more of an effort to rein in the bombing campaign and, and address this issue? This has always been the case. Um, whenever the uh, Houthi rebels have been uh, invited to the table twice, they don't show up, and then it becomes hard. And so if we need to see a, a serious attempt from the uh, Houthis to uh, come to the negotiating table and to try to sort of resolve this issue. Uh, at the end of the day, we're looking at the best uh, outcomes for the Yemeni people. We're looking at um, a, a, a united Yemen as opposed to uh, a once divided one. Um, and um, we hope that the uh, 
UN envoy can uh, achieve his task. Mm -hmm. Now, one more question on a regional issue, which is, of course, of course the dispute uh, within the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council. So now, nearly, nearly three years ago, Saudi Arabia, joined by Bahrain, the UAE, and Egypt, uh, severed diplomatic relations with Qatar, uh, accusing Doha of supporting terrorists and aligning itself with Iran. So the Saudis made a list of demands on Qatar to restore ties, uh, but instead Qatar has moved to forge closer relations with Iran and Turkey. So it's unclear what the boycott um, has definitively achieved. There has been, however, some tentative moves toward reconciliation recently, including the resumption of postal services. So Master, can you tell us where talks stand at the moment in terms of this dispute and what Bahrain would like to see from Qatar to try and put an end to it? Thank you, Anna. I think that there are two ways of looking at this. First, bilaterally. Um, Bahrain and Qatar are the only two nations within the GCC that actually went through uh, a process and a case that went up to the ICJ over a number of uh, islands that were disputed um, and unfortunately um, for the Qataris we presented 83 forged documents to the ICJ and we have uh, retained uh, uh, those islands to Bahrain. Uh, now, uh, why did we not escalate the issue back then? Because we were looking at the best interests of the GCC and the unity of the GCC. But when a number of countries saw more or less the same um, activities coming from the Qatari government, uh, whether it's intervening in internal political affairs, or the housing of terrorist organizations like next door, or the financing of terror organizations uh, throughout the region. Uh, I think there was a time where we had to say uh, there needs to be a stop to it. Uh, media outlets, same thing. There's a clear bias in Qatari media outlets against uh, neighboring countries, but we never see any criticism of uh, issues within Qatar itself. And so, um, I think we are where we are today. Uh, a lot of the countries have uh, adopted, uh, adapted to the new normal. Uh, do we want to see movement, uh, positive movement? Everybody wants to see positive movement. But it's up until the uh, Qataris feel that the, 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 the ser there was a lack of seriousness to the issue from the Qataris. Back in December, there was a meeting uh, between the GCC that the Emir did not show up to. So it, it has become difficult. Um, we do wish that uh, the Qataris will uh, look at the uh, number of uh, issues that we had put forth uh, a number of times and uh, hopefully move forward. Now I want to move uh, closer to, to home. Bahrain has been confronted with its own turmoil uh, during the Arab Spring uh, when pro-democracy protests broke out among the country's Shia majority, demanding more rights from the Sunni-led government. Uh, eventually, there was a crackdown on the protests. Thousands were arrested. There were dozens killed. Uh, now, nine years later, frustrations among the Shia community continue to simmer. Can you talk to us about what the government has done over these past nine years to both address these grievances and the enduring fallout from the violence? I think, first of all, that uh, we have to correct some of the uh, uh, the elements in the question itself. Uh, and, and let's look at Bahrain for 20 years now. When His Majesty the King ascended throne, uh, the first thing His Majesty did was uh, work out a constitution, put, crafted a constitution, put it forth, uh, or a referendum, 98.4% of the people said yes to it. There came the establishment of parliament, uh, three branches of government, very similar to the United States, and it shifted the country from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. That project has been ongoing and is still ongoing. Uh, in 2011, uh, we did one of the things that uh, 
not a lot of uh, countries that were put in the same position did, where we had uh, uh, a commission from abroad to come in and to put forth recommendations that were adopted later on. Now, uh, like I said, the political reform project is an ongoing project. Uh, we have uh, outcomes that can be uh, measured today. Uh, we have doubled the number of participation of women in the uh, legislative uh, body. We have a woman speaker. We are moving in, uh, in a direction that is very open, that is uh, uh, very accepting of others. And I think we're telling the story better. Uh, Bahrain is, uh, is a small country, but it has a story to tell. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why we need to tell it more. And now, I know your government has also made a lot of efforts to promote religious tolerance. Yes. And so, I mean, in terms of, of these efforts to uh, develop democracy, are, do you foresee the government making more effort to be more inclusive of opposition parties that so far have not, uh, not participated? I, I need to go back to, to the question itself, Anna. And, uh, uh, I need to stress the point that there were a lot of entities that were established in 2012 and 13, entities that did not exist in that part of the world. Uh, we introduced the only ombudsman office in the region. Because of the ombudsman office today, we have police officers that are serving time. Uh, we've introduced a special investigations unit connected to the public prosecutor. We have uh, a National Institute for Human Rights. We've established a Prisoners and Detainees Rights Commission. And so all of these entities are yielding uh, 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 results that are measurable. Uh, very recently, a, a year or two, a year and a half ago, we also introduced alternative sentencing. 1,500 people have gone through the program today. And so uh, there are serious efforts, and those efforts are uh, not because of uh, external pressures, but it's because of what the government believes in and how we want to see Bahrain progress. Uh, the question was about religious uh, freedom. Yeah, and then especially in terms of um, welcoming more of the opposition parties that have so far not uh, been able to participate. Again, um, when we look at the parliament today, I was uh, a couple of weeks ago looking at the discussion that was going on. You would be surprised at uh, how tough our MPs are. And like I said, we in Bahrain don't look at people um, regarding their sect or their religion. Uh, we look at them as Bahrainis, and we've always pushed the Bahraini First Initiative. And in the composition of uh, parliament today, you see members from all the different uh, governorates. We had the highest voter turnout in history, uh, in our history, 67%. Uh, and so we would like to maintain that. We would like for us to have a healthy conversation through the proper channels. And that was what we have always adopted. When it comes to religious freedom, Bahrain is one of these countries that is very unique in its composition. Uh, we have people from different faiths, different sects, different religions living in a geographic location that is uh, relatively small. And so in order for the country to move forward, everyone needs to work with one another. You, you can't have people from different beliefs living in different geographic locations. Mm -hmm. What do I have to support my, my argument? We have... Uh, institutions. We have religious institutions that have always been there. We have uh, over 25 non-Muslim religious institutions that are functional in the country. Uh, we have the only synagogue in the region. We have a 200-year-old Hindu temple. This comes to show that the acceptance of other religions has always been a part of Bahrain because of it being an island being on a trade route, being acceptable for others that stop by. And that's, that's how we would like to keep it.
Now, switching gears to the economy, uh, I mean, Bahrain overall economically has been quite successful. There's been fairly steady growth, fiscal reforms, and efforts, as I said, to diversify the economy, um, especially in terms of investing in banking and tourism sectors. Uh, I was reading that there are over 400 financial institutions now based in Bahrain, and of course there's a long-standing free trade agreement with the U.S. So looking ahead, what are the government's priorities to continue this economic growth? And also specifically, is the government doing anything to focus on young people since the region as a whole is facing demographically such a, a, a surge in young people? Um, again, I'll, I'll put out the number. It's 3.7% unemployment rate that we have maintained. Uh, we have learned in the 60s because oil was first introduced in the region in 1932 in Bahrain. But we had learned in the 60s that we have to diversify away from oil. And we have been on that path uh, ever since. The signing of an FTA with the United States is a clear example of uh, the seriousness of Bahrain to open up other avenues uh, and to make sure that uh, the economy is thriving. Now, uh, if, if if we were to look at how much trade is being done between the two countries, we've been able to double our exports to the U.S. over a 10-year 10, 10 period. Uh, the U.S. has been able to triple its exports to Bahrain. We're talking about $10 billion. It's not uh, a big amount, but compared to our GDP, uh, in, in terms of percentage, it's huge. Um, we've learned that government services um, are changing with time. And so we um, maintain a healthy environment for investment, but at the same time, we're looking at ways to increase uh, revenue. Uh, when we look at the introduction of a VAT, for example, uh, it's a 5% VAT. It's a GCC, um, it has been approved, uh, a GCC decision. Uh, but we're not looking at VAT across the board. Uh, daily commodities of water, milk, uh, and those what we tax. But obviously, you look at lobster and caviar, then you have the tax on that. Education is, is, um, is not taxed. Um, medical services are not taxed. And so we have tried to um, introduce uh, the VAT in a way that it won't um, influence the daily lives of, uh, of people. Um, now, if, if we were to look at tourism, tourism has been um, a big one. Um, and for any country to have uh, an increase in tourism, you have to think of your airport. We have a new airport that's being uh, built and will be inaugurated very soon. We're looking at direct flights uh, to the U.S. because we bought 10 uh, Boeing aircrafts, uh, hopefully within the year. We will have a destination here in the U.S. We're looking at other events and other projects. Uh, Formula One, yes, it was the first. Bahrain was the first to introduce Formula One in the region, uh, but also it's fun stuff like uh, uh, Dive Bahrain, the biggest underwater dive park in the world, where we submerged a 747 and made sure that it was uh, submerged uh, in, in an environmentally friendly way. Uh, and we're adding more elements to it. So uh, Bahrain is definitely looking at ways to uh, increase foreign direct investment into it. What does a person or a company get in return? 0% corporate tax, 100% foreign ownership, a talent pool like no other in the region. Um, you look at uh, subsidies uh, that the government introduces uh, and the ease of doing business uh, in Bahrain. Uh, it makes it easier for entities like Amazon Web Services who are looking for a hub in the region and chose Bahrain, uh, an easier decision. Another good one is uh, Mondelez, where uh, it's an Oreo cookie company that uh, said, you know what, we'll choose Bahrain. Uh, we don't look at uh, employees, but we look at their families as well, and we look at creating the right environment um, to, to host uh, foreigners. And when we look at and um, compare it to the West, we see a lot of uh, commonalities there. 
I think I can go with you on the Oreo cookie. I don't, I don't yeah. know about the deep, deep uh, diving or the Formula One, although sometimes I drive that way on the Beltway. But uh, well, now I wanted to reserve the toughest question for last. Uh, the ambassador studied in Boston. They're familiar with the U.S. Uh, through my sports obsessed husband, I have learned that you are a big. Patriots fan. Now, how do you justify this this position? It's been it's been pretty tricky here in Washington. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the time I spent uh, in Boston with my wife, we uh, Patriots weren't doing well. Uh, the moment we, we both graduate, they go dynasty, and, and it was a pity. But um, I, I, I still stay uh, committed to my roots. Uh, I'm still a Patriots fan, still a Red Sox fan. Uh, I, I was actually looking at a contract today where uh, the name of the company was, uh, there was just one letter between Red Sox and the name of the company. And I said, okay, if it was Red Sox, I would have signed it today. <laughs> but um, I, I think it, uh, the whole experience of living in the U.S. and, uh, and it, it, we learned out of class um, as much as we've learned in class. I think it was a fabulous experience, and I always talk to my cultural attaché and making sure that we still have the same number of uh, of students and trying to increase it because the exposure is is just phenomenal. Uh, we're grateful that to have uh, our kids. Uh, live in Washington and endure some of this. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to do so. So in other words, your children will, will be Redskins fans. <laughs> My children have, uh, have Celtics hats and oh. uh, uh, Red Sox hats. Oh. <laughs> well, we've got you on the baseball. I know, not quite on the football, but we'll see, we'll see. All right, so we can open the floor up for a few questions, and I think we'll have a roving microphone. Uh, David, right up here in the front. Mr. Ambassador, great to see you, and thank you very much for your remarks about a country that's truly unique in the world and has been a great friend of the United States. As I think you know, a former uh, military leader said, no country in the world punches above, above its weight the way Bahrain does, and that's not just about military. I should ask you about the Gateway Golf Conference that you're organizing coming up next month. But I also want to ask you about the American Mission Hospital mm -hmm. and the role that it has played in the U.S.-Bahrain relationship. Thank you, David. That's, uh, let me start out with the first uh, question, and it's an important one, because what we have realized is that companies that set up in Bahrain not only access the Bahraini market, but they, access, they have access to the GCC market. It's a $1.5 trillion market. It's the third biggest market in Asia. And I think it's worthwhile for companies to look at a conference that addresses that. And so uh, a number of years ago, Bahrain has uh, organized the Gateway Gulf with the same exact uh, idea in mind. Um, the second question. American Mission Hospital. The American Mission Hospital is uh, an institute that uh, probably started our relationship with the U.S. Uh, in the late 1800s when a group of a number of missionaries from Minnesota came to Bahrain. They set up a small hospital, uh, a church, and a, a school. On the back, uh, on the back porch of that house, um, that was supposed to be a school in the beginning, uh, girls were educated. And so it started out with a girls only educational system and then it moved on to, to include both. But um, it, the beauty is that the American Mission Hospital today has expanded. It has uh, expanded into three other locations in Bahrain. Um, the church is still there and the school today offers both uh, elementary and uh, uh, secondary education. So it's these uh, fundamental institutions that were established in uh, 1889 and still uh, are in uh, function today. Okay, we'll stand over uh, we have a question over there. 
Your Excellency Peru Trinity, Managing Director at the Meridian International Center. Thank you, Anna. Um, I, I first visited Manama in 1999 to take my SATs. I was uh, going to the American International School of Riyadh, and if you did not offer the SATs and ACTs in Saudi Arabia, so I drove over the causeway in 1999 to take them. And then uh, last year, uh, David and I connected at the GEC Summit. I was one of the US uh, delegates to the Global Entrepreneurship Congress uh, in Manama last year. Uh, two, two part question. What is one aspect of the Manama Tehran relationship and the Manama Riyadh relationship that perhaps is not picked up in the press, that is not uh, covered in the media? And then, second question is um, just to give you an opportunity to talk about all the great things that Tamkin, the, the, the Small Business Administration in Bahrain, is doing as well. Well, the, the, thank you. The, the biggest difference is there is no Manama Tehran uh, relationship. There is a very strong Manama Riyadh uh, relationship. Uh, and this has been historic. It's, it's been there for 40 years now. Um, and so, uh, will things change? We don't see it in the foreseeable future. Um, we'll still stay very strong uh, in our relationship with Saudi. We'll still have our issues with Tehran. Uh, until we see a, a change in behavior from uh, the Iranian leadership. Um, Tamkin is, is, a, is a smart uh, question because it's the labor fund that was uh, established by the Bahraini government to endorse uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we've uh, obviously realized that uh, there needs to be a push for entrepreneurship, and uh, that's what happened through Tamkin. Temkin is an entity that uh, provides funding, training, um, and helps with marketing of uh, products for SMEs and hopefully uh, taking them up the, uh, the ladder. So uh, it's, it's been working for us. Uh, we've also established incubators. We've established incubators focused for women as well. Um, there's a, a shopping mall called Riyadat that uh, is an incubator for women uh, entrepreneurs and we've seen a turnover there. We've established uh, ways for women that do not want to go uh, and uh, to work every day but want to work out of home and producing products. And so today there are um, homes that, are, uh, that have a CR and they can produce at home and market via Instagram and other social media. <coughs> Uh, with entities. And so um, Tenkin is, is really a model that has worked for Bahrain. I will make sure I don't run right over there. Uh, good evening, Your Excellency. I'm Mary Cardenato with the World Federation of Tourist Guides Association. I, I, one thing I'm going to remember this evening is that you are a storyteller. You said that you had a story to tell. I would like to ask you, I've never, I have not yet been to your country, but if there's one story you had to tell me tonight, what would that be? I think that uh, the most, <laughs> there are many stories that I can tell, but uh, the story that I like the most about Bahrain is its deep-rooted history. Um, Bahrain has multiple civilizations that have lived on this land. It's a small uh, island, but it's a fascinating island. If you look at the name itself, Bahrain means two seas. Uh, you have, uh, back in the day, in the ocean, uh, you'd have salt water, but also uh, fresh water at the same time. So it truly is a magnificent place. Um, a person needs to go there experience it because we have a 50-50 um, when it comes to ex expats versus locals. You get to meet a lot of locals, you get to talk to a lot of locals, and you also have um, expats to, uh, to see. Um, it has endured a lot. There, has a lot. there were a lot of people that came through the island, but uh, it's very unique in the composition. It's very unique in terms of demographics, and it's what makes Bahrain uh, what it is today as a nation. It's a good story to tell. Uh, 
so everybody should visit. I'll try and visit as well. Uh, well, we want to make sure that we leave enough time for everyone to network, enjoy food and drink. So uh, I want to thank the ambassador so much for this discussion. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming out. Such a wonderful turnout. We have more events. We have a Croatia ambassador discussion on March 25th. And, and I'm sure I'll be put to the test on more events that I, I haven't been uh, yet informed of. But uh, as always, we are so appreciative of your support. And thank you so much to the embassy. And have a good night. Thank you.